Hello everyone and welcome to the first of our video tutorials on Nuisance. Today we're going to be looking at private nuisance and a good preliminary definition for the tort of private nuisance can be found in Miller and Jackson where Denning says quote the very essence of private nuisance is the unreasonable use of man of his land to the detriment of his neighbour. There are two types of nuisance that we're going to study. Private nuisance, which is protecting private rights to the enjoyment of land. So this is the common one where you've got disputes usually between neighbours. And we're also going to look at public nuisance, which is a tort and a crime. And this is for public protection, where a nuisance is affecting a whole class of the public. But today we're going to look at private nuisance. Private nuisance is an interference with a person's enjoyment and use of their land and a really common example would be a neighbour who's playing the music really loud day and night and that's affecting um, the, the neighbour next door. It's important before we start though to point out that not all nuisances are actionable. So interference with TV reception, interference with light, interference with a view, whilst those things are annoying they are not actionable in the tort of nuisance. So look out for those in scenarios. It might be an examiner trying to catch you out. You can't sue for those three things. There are three requirements to prove private nuisance. Firstly, the claimant must have an interest in the land. Secondly, they have to prove there was an unreasonable use of the land. And thirdly, the claimant must suffer some harm. So we're going to look at each of these requirements in turn with the cases that help to explain them. Firstly, our claimant must have an interest in the land. And this is illustrated by Malone and Lasky, where a company rented a house for a manager to live in. Um, and the wife of the manager moved in um, and there were some vibrations next door, which caused a toilet bracket to fall onto her head. And she tried to claim a nuisance because of the vibrations next door, which were clearly a nuisance. Um, however, she was not able to sue because she didn't own the property, nor was she renting it. She wasn't paying any money to be there. So therefore, she didn't have an interest in the land to sue. So this requirement is going to mean that um, children who live with their parents, for instance, are not going to be able to sue for a private nuisance because they don't have an interest in the land if they're not paying rent. So that can operate a little bit harshly on the claimant. The second requirement is that the claimant has to show that there's unreasonable use of the land. And this is quite a complicated thing because the court uses a whole combination of factors to decide whether what the defendant was doing was unreasonable or not. So we're going to look at cases that help to illustrate all of these requirements, sensitivity of the claimant, duration and time of the nuisance, character of the area, utility, reasonable foreseeability of damage, and did the defendant retaliate with any malice? So the first factor to be, to be considered is sensitivity of the claimant. So in this ancient case of Robinson and Kilvert, the claimant stored a very delicate brown paper um, in his home and it was damaged by heat that was coming from the defendant's premises. And he was suing in nuisance um, for this heat that had damaged his property. But it was found that the paper was damaged because it was very sensitive and normal paper would not have been affected. And the court held that a defendant won't be liable where the claimant or his business was abnormally sensitive and an ordinary user would not have been harmed. So this is a bit strange really for us because it seems to conflict with thin skull, take your victim as you find them. Um, but really what the court's doing here is trying to balance the two rights, the right of the defendant to do what he wants to do in his own property with the right of the claimant not to be harmed. And what they're saying here is it only really seems fair to be protecting from things that would affect uh, most people. And if it's due to sensitivity, you can't claim for that. The second thing to consider on unreasonable user is the duration and time of the nuisance. Um, Hulsey and Esso told us something that I think is probably common sense, that you're more likely to have a nuisance if it's occurring at night time when more people are trying to sleep. 
Uh, Crown River Cruises tells us that usually a private nuisance will be a continuing state of affairs. That means something that's happening regularly, it's going on for a long time. But it can be a one-off event. So in River Cruises, it was a one-off firework display was held to be a nuisance. But usually more likely to be if it's going on every night for weeks, for instance. Another factor for unreasonable user is the character of the area. So in Heroes and Peak Ingredients, we had um, Heroes were a mobile phone manufacturing company and they were manufacturing parts in a unit in an industrial estate. And their unit was next door to Peak Ingredients and they were complaining of strong curry and garlic smells coming from Peak's premises. And they said that was affecting staff, staff were leaving, it was causing them financial harm. But there was held to be no actionable nuisance here. And the court said that the character of the neighbourhood will affect whether something is or is not a nuisance. And the court said that in this case, Hero Heroes was working in an industrial estate. And the court said that they must expect more noise, more smells than if it were a residential area. So in the context of this situation, the smells from peak ingredients were not a nuisance. Had this been going on in um, a quiet residential street, the court might well have reached a different conclusion. But because it was an industrial estate, that was held to be reasonable. Still on this issue of character of the neighbourhood, we've got Sturgis and Bridgman, which we'll look at later as well for prescription. Ancient case from 1879. The judge there gave a very famous quote, which is nice to throw into an exam. What would be a nuisance in Belgrave Square would not necessarily be so in Bermondsey. So he's making the point that um, you can't look at the nuisance, the smell or the noise on its own. You have to look at where it's occurring. And would you expect that in that particular neighbourhood? Um, and that will be taken into account by the judge. In Coventry and Lawrence, the Supreme Court said that planning permission permission doesn't necessarily mean something's not a nuisance. So when we're looking at character of the area, um, it can seem a bit harsh because it seems a bit unfair that maybe you won't have a claim just because you happen to live in quite a busy industrial area compared to a rural, more quiet area. Um, but it's all about what the court expects and what is reasonable in the context. The next factor for unreasonable user is utility of the defendant's conduct. And this means that the judge is going to look at whether there was any utility or usefulness. So was what the defendant was doing, did that provide any sort of service to the community that sort of dis, uh, justifies a bit of disruption? So Miller and Jackson was a case where the claimant was hit on the head by a cricket ball that had flown over the fence. And the claimant was trying to sue in nuisance. Um, but the court held here that there was a public interest in having a cricket ground for sport, for entertainment. And that outweighed what was actually quite a small risk in this case. So you've got to also look at whether there's anything useful coming out of the nuisance itself. Our next um, thing to consider here is that the type of nuisance must be reasonably foreseeable. And that comes from the wagon mound. And we've come across this, this case before. And usually um, it's going to be reasonably foreseeable that if something's noisy, for instance, it's reasonably foreseeable that that's going to impact on people's sleep. The next factor for unreasonable user is malice. And this case from 1893 um, involved the claimant who was a music teacher and they were giving music lessons um, in their home. And the defendant who lived next door found the lessons very annoying. There's nothing worse than a, a recorder being played by a kid. I can assure you of that. So they found it annoying. And so the defendant then responded by beating the walls with pots and pans, shrieking, banging trays, trying to disrupt the lesson. Um, 
And the claimant actually succeeded in getting an injunction against the defendant because it was not a legitimate use of the defendant's house. So if someone is doing something solely to annoy the other person out of spite, um, that is likely that they're actually going to be found liable for a nuisance rather than the thing that they were um, irritated by originally. Our final requirement here for nuisance is that the claimant must suffer some harm. Um, and this makes it different from trespass to land, which is actionable per se. Private nuisance is not actionable per se, so you must be able to show some damage, harm, injury or inconvenience. So it could be something um, where you've not got obviously a broken bone, but if you can't sleep, that is obviously going to show inconvenience. In terms of defences then, there are two defences to private nuisance. Please note, coming to a nuisance is not a defence. So you can't say, well, it's their fault for moving in next door or they shouldn't have moved here. Um, that's not a defence because obviously mm. people are entitled to move house um, and expect not mm. to move in next door mm. to a nuisance. So there are two defences that might work, statutory authority and prescription. Statutory authority is quite limited as a defence because this is where the claimant has to prove that their conduct was authorised by law. So there's not going to be many normal uh, people that are going to be able to show this. Um, an example I can give you here would be the Civil Aviation Act. So this act allows um, aircraft like easy jet planes to be flying over your house and you are not able to sue them for a nuisance because um, their conduct is authorised under statutory authority, this act. But this won't really apply to most people. So for most people, they might want to try the next offence, which is prescription. Oh, excuse me. Prescription um, is quite an old fashioned offence where the defendant is saying that he's acquired the right to act in a particular way because they've done so for 20 years or more. Classic case on this is Sturgis and Bridgman from 1879. And our defendant here ran a confectionery shop which operated a noisy pestle and mortar. Look at the date. It had done so for over 20 years and there'd been no neighbours for that time, so there was no complaints. Our claimant then built a consulting room for his practice as a doctor next to this noisy shop. He heard all the noise and brought an action to try and stop it. The defendant tried to use the Ancient Prescription Act and said that he'd been doing this using the pestle and mortar for over 20 years. But his defence of prescription failed because the pestle and mortar didn't become a nuisance until the doctor moved in next door. So the 20 years for prescription would only start at the point the doctor moved in next door um, and not from the point previously. So our principle here is that prescription will be a defence where the nuisance has been going on for 20 years without complaint. In terms of defences then, we've got damages or compensation. Um, abatement um, is also known as self-help. This might be that if a neighbour has taken some property, you can take it back. Um, and injunctions as well. So injunctions are going to be the most useful for nuisance um, because if you're being upset by noise at night, for instance, you don't really want compensation. What you want is the noise to stop. So an injunction will help that to happen. So that's going to be quite key for our claimants. So I'm going to end this video by putting this summary slide on the screen. So you may want to pause it here so you can have a look at the summary of what we've just been through. Um, but basically, it's an interference with a person's enjoyment and use of the land. You can't sue um, for interference with TV, light or review. You must have an interest in the land. It must be an unreasonable use. And we consider all of these complicated factors and there must be some damage, and there are a couple of limited defences here. So in our next video tutorial, we'll be looking at the other type of nuisance, which is public nuisance.